Okay, one of the things that I said in the video on transpiration was that we got experimental evidence uh, to back this up to say that this is actually how uh, transpiration happens and that's why it's a theory and not a hypothesis. Um, so I just want to walk you through uh, the experimental evidence uh, that transpiration happens like we think it does um, and and then we'll have a look at the photometers. So, um, I'll just draw a little leaf on here and you'll remember that what is actually causing the water to move is this idea of evaporation and diffusion out of the leaf which is then causing a pull on that column. So one of the sort of bits of experimental evidence that we can look at is evidence that looks at the rate of transpiration and when that movement actually starts. And uh, the experiment itself is a little bit more complicated than I'm describing. But the idea is that you sort of put a, a warm water cuff around an area of your plant. So this is going to uh, warm up the water. And then a little bit higher up you can stick a, a temperature probe and the idea is, and I will need a filler pen to do this, I've got my glitter pen again. If anybody does know who this belongs to and wants to claim it, um, I'm happy to do that. Uh, so here you've got a distance. If you know what time you've warmed up your water and what time it finishes, it would be the time difference to work out the rate over the distance that that warm water has travelled. Um, and that would, would give you a rate of movement. And actually, if you then did it say further back in the branch of a tree and you put your temperature probe in over the same distance you'd see that it moves first up here and then sort of later on it would move down there and you could do that you know further down and stick your temperature probe in and see that it moves even later in the day. So the very first thing in the morning the water is going to start moving here but it's not going to be moving very well there and certainly even less well there um, and you can then work out that actually the movement starts at the top. So that's what that experiment shows you. It shows you that the movement starts at the top of the tree which implies then that we've got a pull force going on. Uh, the other thing that I said in the video on transpiration was, of course, that the, um, the, the xylem and water column are stuck together by that force of adhesion. So if you can imagine your sort of xylem vessel and your tree trunk. And it's got the xylem and the water. We just did a longitudinal section going up that way. And of course, as the oops, if I do it like that, the faster the water's moving, the more stretchy the column is. So this column is under tension, which tends to then be narrower, so it's pulling in. And if you've got thousands and thousands of xylem vessels, of course, what happens when the water's moving is that the tree trunk moves in. And so here we can see a little graph of change in tree trunk diameter. So we're measuring around it. And you can see that it gets narrower. and it gets wider. 
And so these are, these are just, you know, sort of, it's been measured there and there, two metres and three metres. And so there's our tree trunk getting narrower at sort of 12 noon when the conditions are absolutely ripe for transpiration. So tree trunk diameter. Um, and again, um, there have been questions on this before, on different boards at different times, but you know, you've got to remember that your person writing your questions is hugely experienced in the ways of exam questions. So you might get a graph that sort of, you know, does that over a 24 hour period um, and you may need to compare it to say um, a different graph of a different species that might be doing that yeah, so not getting quite as narrow um, and, and say you know why the circumference of the tree changes or perhaps you know which one is adapted for a dry environment so if it's reducing its diameter less that means it's not doing as much uh, transpiration and that would certainly be an indicator that it might live in a dry environment so tree trunk diameter is always a good one um, just going to get rid of this now and show you yet another exam style question it's just, I, I remember looking at this and thinking, oh my goodness. So, this is a description of an experiment from 1727. This is how we've managed to build up so much evidence. Uh, and this guy, Stephen Hales, cut a branch off a tree about a metre long and uh, sealed the cut end and put a wet bladder over it. Um, So sealing the end would mean that no water would escape and a wet bladder just ensures that doesn't happen. Notice that his tree branches upside down, as it were. However, do remember, where's the water going to be leaving from? It's going to be leaving from the leaves. And it's going to pull the water. Now it can't pull it from that end because that's cut and sealed. But what he's done at this end, at eye end, um, and you can probably read this for yourselves on the video, says he cut the other end of the branch and attached a little glass tube to it with water in it and then dipped the whole thing in mercury down here. So this X, that's a bucket of mercury. I don't think they had health and safety in those days, to be honest. And... He left it outside, warm afternoon, and the mercury, he said, went up by 30 centimetres. So what is happening here is that the water's evaporating from the leaves, it's pulling on this water, which is pulling the mercury out of the bucket. So the water and the mercury are stuck together. Um, and then he says, when the mercury reached the cut end of the stem at I, reached up here, air bubbles appeared and the mercury ran back into the bowl. So the air bubble here is going to break the water column. And then you've not got that tension holding it up and that's why the mercury drops down into the bowl. So why did he bother doing this? Well it shows really um, that first of all the water movement is passive. No, it's not and although we think and you will have been taught at school yes it always moves from roots to leaves obviously the root end of the plant will be there it will go in either direction um, but it couldn't the water couldn't get out of there because of this sealing up of that end of the um, of the of the tree trunk of the branch and so it was coming out of the leaves and pulling the water up. And so it shows that it's passive and it can go in either direction. Remember, it's just going through those very hollow cells. So that's just sort of, you know, a couple of evidential uh, experiments for you. And then, of course, we come on to potometers. 
<laughs> and this is the experiment that you did. And this is our picture of our bubble potometer. So um, up here we've got the plant which of course is losing water and it's therefore pulling water up its stem. The idea is, I'll just colour the water in, that all of this equipment all the way down is full of water. So that's sort of really important that you set the thing up under water, it's all full of water, you've got one continuous coherent stream and we sort of drew in by pulling on the syringe a little air bubble there and you can then measure, what you measure is the distance and the time taken for it to travel so the air bubble is going to move down that scale as this plant pulls water up through. So if they're going to ask you about potometers, they might ask you about the setup. So it requires the whole system so you set up underwater. Why is that important? no air bubbles and a continuous column of water. Alongside that you have to cut the stem under water to main, again to maintain that column of water so that it will pull things up. Um, what's your syringe for? The syringe, this is to reset the bubble between readings and of course we used it to draw the air bubble up in the first place. So things that we could investigate then, you can use a fan to do uh, wind speed. You can uh, alter temperature, not easily in a lab, but it is possible. And you could do uh, light by um, moving the lamp different distances. You could uh, have filters for wavelength. Um, because I'm old, obviously, I watch Countryfile, and one of the things that was on Countryfile uh, this week, so in 2017, uh, was there was a guy who was growing um, lettuce and tomatoes under different lighting regimes, and one of the things that he said is, oh, blue light. Uh, encourages the stomata to open so you could certainly do this experiment to to show that. Obviously if you're doing wind speed things you will need to keep the same would be the temperature so you'd need a cool fan you'd need the light to be the same both in terms of colour and intensity so you put your lamp, you know, the same distance away. If you're doing temperature, you're going to need to keep the wind speed the same, the light colour and intensity the same. If you're doing light, by moving the lamp different distances, you'd need to leave, keep your wavelength the same, you'd need to keep your wind speed the same, you'd need to keep the temperature the same. If you're doing filters, you'd need your lamp the same distance away, you'd need your fan on the same speed and you'd need your temperature to be the same. And can we just bear in mind here that there is no such thing as room temperature. So the room I am sitting in is something like 21 degrees. And you know, one of the labs might be 24 degrees and the, the theory room might be uh, 18 degrees. 
all rooms are different temperatures so you need to specify temperatures if you're asked to do that. Okay.